going to start. Uh, I'm Wing, and today I'm going to uh, just do a short uh, presentation on a cystic lung disease. I have uh, nothing to disclose. So today's contents uh, will uh, compose of a review of uh, radiological definitions and features of uh, any uh, air-containing lucency on a uh, radiograph. Then I'm going to uh, go to uh, went through some differential diagnosis of uh, cystic and cavitary lung lesions. Then I'm going to end it with uh, going through uh, clinical manifestations and uh, management of uh, lymphangial leomyomatosis and uh, pulmonary Langerhans cells uh, histocytosis. So the reason why I want to go through the radi radiological definition and features is because uh, with the advance of uh, high resolution uh, CAT scans, it can help us uh, narrow down the differentials of uh, cystic lung disease. And it's really important for us to understand uh, what uh, we mean when we uh, go through uh, the glossary of terms in thoracic imaging. So first, uh, I have cyst that is shown uh, in this picture, which is uh, which is uh, defined as air-filled spaces that are sharply uh, surrounded by really thin walls. Usually it will be less than two millimeters, but according to definition, anything less than four millimeters can be defined as a cyst. Uh, the shape can be regular or irregular. Uh, usually it's more round-shaped, and uh, usually it's also without associated with any uh, emphysema. And it can also actually be uh, distinguished from emphysema by uh, looking at the blood vessels around the cyst. If there's a, a blood vessels in the peripheral uh, around the around the, the wall, that's more likely to be cyst. While if there's something within the air lucency, it's more likely to be emphysema. Next, I have cavity, which is uh, an air-filled lesions that have a thick wall that's more than four millimeters. It can be uh, caused by a pulmonary consol consolidation, a mass, or lung nodules. And inside, it can also contain fluid, debris, or any like granuloma tissues. So a cavity is usually for also can be formed by uh, like a consolidation of mass with a necrotic tissues that just uh, slowly drain out, causing this thick wall uh, appearance. Next, I have bullae, which is defining a uh, air, air containing space or cystic space that is more than uh, one centimeters with a smooth and a thin wall. And usually a thin wall means a wall less than one millimeters. And breaths are basically bullae that is less than one centimeters. And breaths are usually more uh, at the subpural spaces. And I have bronchial atheses next. Uh, this are some, it can be a mimicker for cystic lung disease. If you have a cystic uh, bronchiectasis, it can look like cysts on a CAT scan, but this can be distinguished by uh, finding a pulmonary, uh, pulmonary vasculature artery uh, next to uh, the bronchi. Then I have emphysema that I uh, mentioned briefly about uh, basically uh, irregular asymmetric areas of uh, decreased uh, lung attenuations. They don't have a definer wall, and the size can be variable. And depending on the disease process, the distributions can be different as well. And lastly, uh, not lastly, but uh, honeycombing uh, clusters of a cyst that is usually between 3 to 10 millimeters, however, can also be up to 20 millimeters in diameter. And it's often really subpural in distributions, and they have a really well defined wall as well. But again, the wall is usually thin and less than four millimeters. And lastly, I have a pneumotacelli, which is a really long, thinner air spaces in the lung. Uh, by definition, they are often caused by pulmonary infection or trauma, and they are usually transient. And after the underlying cause is treated, they should go away uh, in the long term. After going through the definitions uh, of uh, the radiological features, I would also like to uh, talk about cavitary lung disease just as a comparison to uh, cystic lung disease so that we can uh, try to compare the differentials uh, between the two. In terms of cavitary lung lesions, it is the most important part is to distinguish which 
cavity is more likely to be malignant versus benign. And one of the methods is by looking at the size of the wall. Uh, from one of the older studies, it has shown that when you have uh, cavity with lung lesions with a wall more than 15 millimeters, it is 95% associated with malignancy. While if it's between 5 millimeters and 15 millimeters, it has an equally chances to be benign and, or malignant. And if it's less than 5 millimeters, it's most likely to be benign. Other causes of cavitary lung lesions include infections that can be bacterial, fungal, or associated with uh, parasites. Uh, immunological or autoimmune uh, disease can cause this cavitary lung lesions as well. So are uh, thromboembolic disease and uh, bronchiectasis. For cystic lung disease, there are different ways to uh, classify them, and one of one of the ways that I find is to look at their distribution. They are mostly subcategorized into focal or multi multifocal cystic lung disease, diffuse cystic lung disease, and honeycombing cystic lung disease. For focal or multifocal cystic lung disease, the causes include uh, some congenital or malformations uh, of the bronchus, uh, infections such as TB or, or, uh, or PCP, or lymphoid uh, interstitial pneumonia, disgramous uh, interstitial pneumonia. For diffuse cystic lung disease, the most common ones are pulmonary Langerhans cells histocytosis uh, and lymphoangiomyomatosis, while honeycomb uh, cystic lung disease include asbestosis, IPF, uh, collagen vascular disease, HP, or sarcoidosis. And for the majority of uh, cystic lung disease in the adults, uh, usually uh, with uh, this four underlying uh, disease process, one is uh, lymphoangiomyomatosis, LAM, this next is a uh, PLCH, pulmonary Langerhans cells histocytosis, and we also have a uh, blackhawk dupe syndrome, that's uh, have a which has a keratitis rash, and uh, lymphoid uh, interstitial pneumonia, and due to uh, <coughs> Time restriction. Today, I will focus on both a LAM and PLCH. And diagnostic approach usually uh, include having a full clinical history, as in uh, age, sex, what are the pulmonary manifestations, such as uh, does the patient has spontaneous pneumothorax, uh, if they are having like worsening dyspnea on exertions, any other extra pulmonary manifestations such as uh, skin nodules uh, or abdominal pain that can hint them may have uh, uh, angiolipoma or any radiological features that we find on uh, chest radiographs. For LAM, it is a cystic lung disease that's caused by uh, infiltration uh, of smooth muscle cells in the lung. It is presumptively spread by blood and lymphatics. And it is also associated with uh, tu uh, tuberous sclerosis gene mutations. The, pepho the, the pathogenesis uh, of LAM is shown over here. So there's two forms of LAM. One is uh, the form associated with uh, tuberous sclerosis. In that form, the TSC1 has a mutation and is present in all cells uh, in, in the patients. While the sporotic form, which is in patients who without tuberous sclerosis, is a small, a somatic uh, mutation that uh, affect the TS2 genes, and uh, and and is only extensively, uh, exclusively only affect uh, female, usually at a childbearing age. So the pathogenesis uh, of LAM is caused by the mutation in TS TSC. So the TSC genes encoded uh, hematin and tuberin. They, are, they form a heterodimer over here that actually inhibit uh, some, some other proteins that activates the MTOR pathway, the mechanical target of uh, rampamycin. And the MTOR pathway is, is, uh, is a pathway that increases protein translation and causes a lot of serial growth and survival. Having, uh, mutated uh, TSC uh, genes protein will upregulate the MTOR pathway causes uh, inappropriate, inappropriate cellular growth and uh, survival. 
and the epidemiology of a lamb are usually FH, the FAH of diagnosis usually at around uh, 30 to 40 years old. Again, a uh, sporotic lamb is uh, entirely restricted to females almost. Uh, there's like one case report in the past that found that there's a lamb in a male, but there's only one case report. And it is said that it's about 3.4 to 7.8 per million, per million women in the US and Europe has a, a lamb. And it, different from a PLCH, it is not associated with a smoking. In terms of uh, clinical history, affects young female, the presenting symptoms and signs is going to vary depending on uh, what are the organs affected. So most common uh, commonly signs and symptoms for pulmonary manifestations will present with uh, unexplained progressive dyspnea on exertions uh, and followed by spontaneous pneumothorax that can uh, recur if it is not treated or the presence of a uh, Chiris uh, pro effusion. For extra pulmonary manifestations, the most common one is uh, renal angiomyolipomas that is actually shown in this picture. It is seen as a more uh, similar to a fatty strands uh, density on the CAT scan. In uh, angiomyolipoma that's more than four centimeters has to be uh, has to be paid uh, more attention as it can cause uh, significant bleeding. So uh, some interventional uh, interventional radiology treatment may be needed. Other than that, you can also have a uh, lymph angiomyelomas of the retro peritoneum and pelvis. You can also find lymphadenopathy or uterine uh, lamb lesions uh, in uterine as well. And to make a diagnosis of lamb, there's two ways, uh, but usually we encourage to make a diagnosis clinically. According to the ERS guideline, you can, uh, as long as you have reasonable uh, certainty with uh, characteristics uh, changes on the CAT scan of, with patients who have history of tuberous sclerosis or with patients who have found to have an angel myolipoma. Uh, uh, in other organs or with patients who have significant lymphadenopathy or chirothorax with a serum VEGFD level of more than 800, you can make a diagnosis uh, of LAMP and to consider uh, further treatment uh, of the disease process. However, if we are not so sure about the diagnosis clinically, we can also proceed with uh, getting another CT MRI of the ab abdomen to see if patients have any uh, extra pulmonary manifestations. Uh, Transbronchial biopsy or cytogenic exam or the pleural fluid can also be diagnostic. Um, and if everything else fails and we still don't have a uh, definite diagnosis, you can also uh, do a rest biopsy as well. And radiological features of uh, LAMP. On chest radio Radio, uh, normal chest radiograph, it will be pretty difficult to uh, to find. The findings can be really mild, but sometimes you can see some uh, linear uh, opacities throughout the, throughout the lung. However, on uh, HRCT, you can see round, smooth cysts that are usually uh, equal in size with uh, diffuse uh, distributions uh, throughout the lung parenchyma. Uh, lung nodules are usually not common, however, that can still happen in uh, some specific form. And these are just uh, two examples uh, of a lamb on a CAT scan. So again, you can see this like wrong, diffuse cystic changes throughout the whole lungs. All of them are surround, and all of them are different from emphysema because it's around that really thin wall. That if we can have a measurement, it will be less than four millimeters. And in terms of uh, pathology, uh, lamb is uh, characterized by smooth muscle cells infiltration in the uh, lung parenchyma, airways, lymphatic, and blood vessels. 
and there's also some Fenwall cystic changes that you can see on uh, on histology. And if there's a if there's a lamb nodule where they have a lamb disease, you can see uh, cuboidal epithelial cells in the peripheral of the of the of the of the nodule or the lamb lesions, and then in the middle it will be packed by small spindle-shaped shells. That is kind of difficult to see over here. I cannot. Don't want to call it nodule, just because then people think, oh, I'm going to see a nodule on there. Right. Can't see them too, and it's more just. I think a proliferation of that. A lamb lesion. Right. Yep. And the lamb lesion is also uh, positive for a uh, human uh, melanoma black 45, HMB 45, which shows over here. All this uh, black staining will be positive. And treatment for lamb uh, mainly consists of uh, two different parts. One is uh, the supportive care. Uh, the second is uh, the pharmacological treatment for supportive care, avoidance of cigarette smoking, uh, administration of full vaccines, pulmonary rehab, minimizing exogenic uh, estrogens and uh, bronchodilators for patients who have uh, decreased FE1 or FEC1 is is the mainstream. And if a patient have a pro uh, have a pneumothorax, a pruritus should be performed because the recurrent rate is high. It's up to almost 70%. And for pharma uh, pharmacological treatment of lamb, it includes uh, MTOR uh, inhibitors such as serolimus. And there's a study uh, uh, that is called uh, Multicenter International Lamb Efficacy of Serolimus. That is a randomized double bind tri uh, ran uh, trial of 89 patients who has a uh, moderate uh, to severe uh, decrease in lung function, uh, as that defined by FE1 less than 70% uh, predicted, and it's a 12 month, uh, 12 month uh, treatment uh, period with a double bind with placebo followed by another 12 month observations uh, period after treatment is discontinued. And the primary endpoint of the studies is the difference between the group in the rate of change of FEV1. And here is just uh, the demographic of the studies. Uh, there's really no significant uh, difference between uh, the two groups in terms of demographics, in terms of FEV1, FEC, and the ratios of FEV1, FEC. Uh, even the DLCO, there's no significant difference. And uh, this is the results of uh, the studies. In treatment phase, we can see that uh, for patients with LAM and decreased FEV1, if they are treated with cyrolimus, their FEV1 actually significant stabilized or even mildly improved compared to the group that is on placebo that has a constant decline in FEV1 over one year. And after the treatment is discontinued over here at 12 months, the rate of decline in the treatment group actually resumed at the same rate as the placebo. So even after you treat it with cyrolimus, that is not going to exacerbate your decline once you discontinue the therapy. However, the patients uh, will not going to have continued benefit if the therapy is discontinued. And it is also worthy to mention that the cyrolimus uh, Therapy uh, dosing is to have a rampamycin, uh, a serum rampamycin level between uh, 5 to 15. And over here, uh, sorry, the next graph on graph B also shows a difference in uh, FEV1 and FEC between the placebo group and the treatment group. Again, you can see that cyrolimus has an improvement if, uh, in uh, FEC while the placebo group has a decrease in FVC and a decrease in FVV1. And this is another graph that shows the percentage of uh, uh, changes in FVV1 uh, between the treatment and placebo uh, group. So, and this is a table that uh, summarizes all the data. Uh, in brief, the patients who are treated with cyrolimus after 12 months they have uh, they have uh, about 153 millimeters more in uh, 
FEV1 compared to the placebo group, which is about an 11% 11 uh, increase compared to the placebo group. Although we don't have uh, studies uh, to look at if the increase in FEV1 going to change symptoms of survival uh, in a uh, lamp patient. However, we know that in COPD patients, if there's an uh, increase of FEV1 more than 100, 100 milliliters, a lot of the time the patients uh, can experience some uh, improvement in their symptoms. Also, this, uh, this table also uh, shows that the Cyrolimus treatment group also improved uh, the FVC, improved the the scores in uh, functional status and quality of life. However, that does not show any improvement in uh, the diffusion capacity or six-minute walk test. More studies uh, on the MTOR inhibitors. There's one study. There's a retrospective studies of 12 patients uh, that. Uh, with LAM that's follow up up to five years on Cyrolimus and then they can uh, find there's a significant reduction in the rates of decline in FAV1. And there's another open label studies of a Cyrolimus uh, for two years in 63 women that shows a stabilization of FAV1 and FVC. And there's actually another one studies that's done more, more recently that uh, looks at uh, the mTOR inhibitor at a lower serum level. They show that a serum level less than 5 may still have some uh, benefits uh, in uh, treating uh, the disease. And if uh, treatment fail, uh, as Cyrolimus only induces uh, stabilization of disease without really causing uh, sub like re remission of the disease, if the patient continues to worsen, lung transplantation is a co consideration. Uh, there's really no guidelines of when to refer the patient for lung trans transplantations uh, for LAM. However, the general consensus is that for any patient with LAM who has a NYHA functional cast fee or four, it might be a good time uh, to consider lung transplant. And the studies that uh, supported it uh, included uh, 45 bilateral, 34 single lung transplants for LAMP studies over here. That shows a survival rate that is um, pretty um, similar to uh, the national uh, survival rate uh, for lung transplant for other cause of diseases. So is this study, uh, just, so this Japanese studies of uh, 57 patients. It could, yes. Uh, lung, uh, lamb, so LAM is actually considered something that can, uh, metast it can metastasize and it can stay in the body. So after lung transplant, this could definitely recur. However, even if there's a chance of uh, recurrence, if the patients uh, continue to deteriorate, lung transplantations might still uh, actually improve uh, survival compared to not having transplant in patients who have severe lung disease due to uh, LAM. And I'm moving forward to uh, pulmonary Langerhans cell histocytosis. Uh, it is formerly known as uh, eosinophilic granuloma of the lung, uh, pulmonary Langerhans cell granulomatosis, or pulmonary histocytosis X. It is uh, uncommon in the sexual lung disease that primarily affect uh, young adults. And it is uh, part of a spectrum of a systemic Langerhans cell histocytosis that can affect uh, many organs. And it is most commonly encountered only in young adult smokers, up to uh, 80 to 90 percent of uh, adult patients who smokes. So sorry, up to like 90 percent of patients who has a uh, PLCH actually uh, has a history of uh, smoking. And it has a uh, ecogenic distribution, and the duration of illness is usually less than uh, one year prior to diagnosis because they often present uh, with uh, symptoms. And here is a proposed uh, pathogenesis of uh, PLCH. So the exact mechanism is not known yet. However, it is proposed that like cigarette smoking or some environmental factors is going to uh, activate the. Uh, the Langerhans cells, which is a dendritic cells and work as an antigen presenting cells. 
that recruits multiple other uh, cytokines like uh, cofactors and uh, other uh, inflammatory cells such as lymphocytes, eosinophils, macrophage, and all of this causes uh, T-cell mediated autoimmune cell in injury causing uh, formation of uh, airway center nodular lesions, uh, fibroblast elevations, and eventually causing uh, airway uh, remodeling fibrosis and causing uh, premature uh, emphysema. And the presenting features of PLCH usually come with uh, incidental uh, abnormalities on uh, chest X-ray. It can also uh, be found by uh, spontaneous uh, pneumothorax or any respiratory or constitutional symptoms such as non-productive coughs, dyspnea on exertions, chest pain, fatigue, weight loss, or fever should uh, raise a clinical suspicious uh, for uh, PLCH, especially in uh, young adult smokers. So different from a lamb, for a DLCH, you can see a cystic or nodular infiltrate on a chest imaging. Um, cigarette smoker with uh, upper lobe uh, infiltrates, history of a spontaneous or recurrent pneumothorax, lung infiltrates, history of uh, different skin rashes or diabetes insipidus can also, also raise a suspicious uh, for a PLCH. And HRCT is actually very characteristic of uh, PLCH that we will talk about, and sometimes can even be diagnostic. However, if the diagnosis is not sure, a bronchoscopy is a uh, tr uh, transbronchial bi uh, biopsy is diagnostic about 30% of the cases. Uh, it is very re valuable though to exclude other causes, including infections. And if you have uh, extra pulmonary uh, lesions, a biopsy can be a good idea too. So here are some of the CT features for uh, PLCH. And it is usually both nodular and cystic abnormalities, and mostly in the upper and the middle lung fields. And uh, it is proposed that usually for PLCH, the abnormality starts uh, as a nodular lesions, and then it's slowly becoming more cystic. So for patients who, uh, when they are diagnosed, if there's more cystic lesions than a nodular lesions, it's actually a uh, worse prognosis compared to just uh, more nodular lesions. And the cystic changes in the PLCH is also uh, really irregular, and we really basally shaped it, and they are also uh, not uh, the same size uh, as in lamp. So again, these are some uh, examples. You can see a nodular lesions over here on the arrow. Uh, you can see a cystic change with the black arrow. Here you see multiple cystic and nodular changes def uh, diffuse throughout the whole lung. And this is another example that, is, uh, that it shows more uh, upper and middle lung field uh, predominance. In terms of uh, pathology, it is characterized by a uh, Langerhans cell uh, infiltration. We can see a uh, cellular nodules uh, on biopsy, as shown over here. We uh, usually start with cellular nodules, and they will become more uh, satellite-shaped fibrotic scars later in the process. And the uh, immunohistochemical uh, staining is positive for both uh, S100 and CD1A. And you can also see some uh, smoking uh, induces changes, such as uh, macrophage uh, accumulations that you can see uh, here. The management usually start with uh, smoking ces uh, cessation. Um, sometimes it can cause a disease stabilization or re uh, regressions and even resolutions. However, most uh, more than two thirds of the patients can. Uh, progress, and if they progress, then it should start to consider pharmacotherapy uh, or even chemotherapy. Uh, cost, uh, a trial of uh, steroid is usually uh, will be given. However, the efficacy is quite limited, and if that does not work, then chemotherapy such as uh, 
scatterbrain um, can sometimes uh, induce a remission or improvement. Other than that, uh, methotrexate, azathioprine can also be used. It and, and there are some studies about uh, BRAF inhibitors uh, that is, that is uh, under studies. Um, but some uh, preliminary uh, studies uh, show that you can cause stabilization and improvement of the disease process. However, people usually relapse uh, after discontinue of the agent. Do you want to make a comment if this is for stomach or pulmonary limited? Uh, I think this, so I think for the steroid it will be uh, usually limited to uh, lung. I actually did not look into uh, if this is more systemic or Malignancy, right. And since we're talking about malignancy, it's also important to remember that PLCH might have some components of uh, malignancy. It has been like <coughs> talks about like if there's more like a stimulation process autoimmune process, but uh, since uh, the, the disease process do involve like BRAF or ARAF uh, pathway that is, uh, that is, uh, that do, uh, that was found in uh, sarcoma, so it is thought that partially uh, PLCH is a neoplastic process. It's also important to treat uh, other disease complications such as uh, pneumothorax, respiratory failure, and DI. And if everything fails, uh, lung transplantation is a consideration as well. <coughs> These are my references.